And this is a topic we were talking about last week, and the idea of mining for nostalgia. Because it has certainly been getting, this past year has been a very big one for, uh, wait, hold on. Mm -hmm. But, um, as I was saying, this last year, we, or even over these last few years, nostalgia has been a very big part of marketing decisions to either bring back classic video games, re-release or redo TV shows and movies, and even with the idea of really mining for nostalgia with the classic genres. Yep, retro keeps getting bigger, and not only that, but... There's also the whole retro game market that we talked about on a previous part, which for people watching this record, I'll include a link or an annotation somewhere right now for that. But, retro games, and by extension nostalgia, is a very big marketing push. And there's a few reasons for it. One is that you kind of have a foundation already, which makes it easier to develop. Again, 2D platformer, you can really, anybody can really start making that game, and it's not like they're going to have to go too far in terms of how to design that. The same thing with a lot of the TV shows and movies we're seeing, excuse me, rebooted. I mean, everybody remembers the Ghostbusters reboot that I'm sure everybody loves right now. Another point, as uh, Janshvik saying, when it comes to retro, when it comes to games, is that you don't need to do a lot to get those games to work. And one of the things that Nintendo certainly sold was kind of the easeability of the NES and SNES Classic. Which I'm curious, are they even still available? <laughs> Let's see. Yep, it looks like it's still being sold. But for a time, though, that NES Classic was <laughs> PS1 Nikes? Really? No, I have not. Now I need to look that up. What the hell? Air Force One Low PlayStation? Somebody is selling sneakers for $6,000. Wow. That, that hurts me a little bit right there. When I'm trying to buy computer parts, and I see someone auctioning off or trying to sell a shoe for six grand, Or, I'm sorry, a sneaker, because there is a difference there. But yeah, people love that kind of retro branding. And hold on one second. I'm asking a family member to bring some water, because I, I think I need it with my voice starting to go. And then you guys get to watch me drink a, half a bottle of water on stream. But, while I'm getting the water delivery, um, when it comes to this kind of stuff, again, companies are definitely mining for that nostalgia craze. Some of them are kind of the ones who put themselves in that situation. Again, Nintendo is not doing the virtual console anymore. The PlayStation 1 games aren't being found that easily. And again, when we talk about some of the older stuff, many younger gamers have never experienced that to begin with. So let me see here. Here's the SNES Classic. I mean, when you look at the games that were included on it... Where is the list? Yeah, when you look at this list of games that were on the SNES Classic, and watch as I magically reach off-screen and get water. There we go. So. When we look at this list of games on the SNES Classic here, I mean, this is just like nostalgia personified here. I mean, anything that includes Super Mario RPG, Earthbound, and Donkey Kong Country, 
that is basically instant buy for a lot of old school fans. And if they would have included, uh, oh, I wish they would include Donkey Kong Country 2 on there. That would have been epic. <laughs> I think you may be a little late for that, uh, Dusoviak, because they're releasing Dusk and Ion Maiden, I believe, early next year, which are retro FPSs right there. Mm -mm -mm. But yeah, when you look at the SNES Classic, I mean, that's not mining for nostalgia. I don't know what is. And then when you look, but then you look at companies that have kind of done it wrong with Sony. And the PlayStation Classic, or PS1 Classic, because I'm sure there will be a PlayStation 2 Classic at some point. It is nowhere near as impressive. I mean, it's great that they include uh, Metal Gear, Odd World, and Rayman. But again, no cl uh, Crash Bandicoot, no Parasite Eve on that. Why is Fortnite coming up when I type in Sony PlayStation? <laughs> Very weird there. Hello, yeah. Yeah, as we've said, this is why I'm such a huge proponent of game preservation. Because there are so many games being released that a lot of people are never... Or a lot of games that were released that most people will never get to experience. It was in my, when I made the book 20 Essential Games that a lot of the games I include were titles that most people probably haven't played. I mean, there are some on there that I'm sure everyone has played, like GoldenEye and Metal Gear. But then you got games like The World Ends With You, XCOM, I don't want to spoil the whole list there, but there are titles there that, again, most people will never play despite how important they are towards game design. And this was one of the reasons why I love the fact Nintendo had the Virtual Console, because having an easy and obviously you know virus-free way of playing some of these older games is such a godsend. It's why so many older gamers have turned to emulators, which I know there's quite a bit of a polarized discussion there. But, like I said, if there is literally no other way to play these games outside of outright piracy or emulation, what is your option? I mean, what is option B in that case? If you literally can't play this game without this stuff, how are we supposed to hold on to our history? And like we've said before, the game industry has been terrible when it comes to preserving their video games and preserving their history. The fact that it's hard to find NES games that are, what, 25 years? But we can still watch movies 30, 40 plus years ago is kind of interesting. And again, some of that is the hardware as well. It's not just you, you know, downloading a ROM. You need to make sure you have a hardware or an emulator that can handle that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Exactly, Mike. In 15 years from now, we'll be talking about games like Fortnite and Red Dead Redemption 2 as old man games. You know, you're still playing Fortnite, that old piece of crap, or who the hell's playing Red Dead Redemption 2 anymore? We're up to who knows what. Maybe we'll be at Grand Theft Auto 9. Or, I'm sorry, at their rate, it will just be Grand Theft Auto 6 at the rate Rockstar develops their games. But it's crazy when we look at how much things have changed. And one of the things that's very interesting, again, about a lot of the games, especially when we talk about retro games today, is that the games of the 80s and 90s was a very experimental time for the game industry. You're not going to be seeing games like Sacrifice, like... Uh, might and Magic, or even stuff like Baldur's Gate, uh, Phantasmagoria, and so on in today's market. One, because some of those games just did not work. Again, when you're experimenting, sometimes the experiment works, sometimes it doesn't. But it still creates that very strange niche of games. In the last part, for those of you watching this recorder right now, I mentioned Forced Showdown which was a very great and innovative title that I don't know if we're going to see another developer copy that game again. But if nobody does it, then that game design is lost to the ether. And 
if you don't remember that, then how are people supposed to keep making new stuff if they don't have a history to draw on? If all you think about is what's hot, then all we're going to see again is whatever the trend is. Whether it was mascot platformers, survival horror for a time, and now Battle Royale. I don't want to be playing 10 years of Battle Royale games, and I'm sure people watching this right now agree with me on that one. And again, it's kind of why the independent scene has really taken to that retro scene. Because they can look at these older games and go, huh. That was very interesting. I want to try and make something else like it. It's why Stardew Valley came to be. The developers said that nobody was making a Harvest Moon style game for the PC, so why not me? But very few developers in the grand scheme of things have that luxury to be able to look back and even be able to know about what those games are. In 15 years from now, when today's kids are maybe tomorrow's independent developers, are they really going to be able to play stuff like Super Mario World? Like, uh, what was it? Uh, Secret of Evermore? Or even stuff like uh, Act Razor? I mean, this is one of those things that always drives me crazy about retro games, is that you have people today, or today talking about these games like these mythical, you know, unicorns, you know, a long time ago, in the year 1901, or stuff like that, there was this game that combined action, adventure, and city building, and then it was Lost of the Ages, and I remember playing that game as a child, so I get to feel extra old there, but... It's very hard, I think, to try and keep these games preserved. I mean, as a good case in point, last week we tried to play... <laughs> oh, don't say that too, Lally. We tried to play Doom 2 and get that streamed on OBS. And it was just not working, because OBS and DOS Boss apparently don't like each other that much. And this is a very big situation when it comes to trying to get these games preserved because most people who are trying to preserve or play these old games are doing it from a streaming or again trying to make money off of that so if you can't easily play those games you're not going to want to go back and revisit them because how many people have the time these days to go back and play a snake rattle and roll for the nintendo when they could be playing something like darksiders 3 or again fortnite or Battlefield, and so on and so on. And it's that very weird economy of the game industry that on one hand, people consider it art. But on the other hand, a lot of people look at it like the same disposable technology that we see with computer parts. Again, like this is a great point for me. I'm buying new parts right now, which I can tell you in probably a year from now, or probably six months, will be completely obsolete. You're not going to want... Again, when I bought my first computer, 6 gigabytes of RAM was considered, you know, like putting three engines into a car. Like, you're never going to need that. That's crazy. And now on my next computer, I'm looking at getting 32 gigabytes of RAM. And who knows? Maybe in four years from now, we'll be up to 100 gigabytes. Maybe at some point, we'll be at terabytes of RAM in a computer. I remember when six again. This were, if Rob was here, we have our old man talk again. I remember when four megabytes of RAM was considered a luxury for your computer. And for all the younger gamers watching this right now, I think they just you know their jaw just dropped to the floor. And again, that's the thing about hardware that it's always being pushed forward. So a lot of people treat it as just you know trash. When, you know, Blu-ray players <laughs> came out, it made DVDs obsolete for a lot of people. When DVDs came out, it made VHS. Yeah, that is interesting. Because I'm getting a, an 8-core processor. I think it's at... Hmm. What is my new processor going to be at? Let's go to the order form now. My 8 core is going to have. It's going to be 4.3 max boosted. But where is it pre. Where is the define of it? Hmm. 
It says it's at 4.3 gigahertz. Hmm. But yeah, like we didn't see that. All right, so it's like right around there. But yeah, like we're not seeing that huge amount of stuff. And again, as Mike knows, I am not the hardware guy. Well, I got to. One for uh, trying to play these latest games and streaming. The point, the problem is that when you're streaming video games, it takes a additional toll on your computer. Something that I've learned the hard way with trying to do stuff like that. And even my old, my computer today is nowhere able to play games like Frostpunk, XCOM 2, and yeah, don't even think about me playing Fortnite or PUBG. So, and the thing for me is, I when I buy in computer parts, I'm thinking five to ten years down the line. Like, you're not going to be seeing me talk about computer parts for at least another five to ten years when this is all over. Uh, well, I got the processor for two eighty five when it's normally like three forty. So, I guess that's a small deal. I did get the 500 uh, gigabyte solid state drive for, what was it? What did I spend on that? Again, I got all these parts like on like multiple pages, so I'm trying to remember it all off the top of my head. But yeah, I'm thinking about putting either a two terabyte or a four terabyte normal drive into this computer as well. Let's see. But while I'm trying to pull all this stuff up, again, hardware is viewed by a lot of people as being disposable. Smartphones is a very great example of this. My smartphone right now is two years old. And that's, again, like five years. Okay, so my new solid state drive I got for 117 it was originally 150 And I believe this is kind of like a next generation drive. Oh, hell no. I'm not that crazy. I do all my uh, Black Friday stuff online. Just like I'm going to be doing Cyber Monday online, but again, everybody does that. Let's see. What do we have here? Do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, they said they were offering like additional promotion codes, and no, it doesn't really do much there. All right, yeah, that was not that big of a deal. Yep. Yep, Cyber Monday is that. But yeah, like when it comes to a lot of hardware, again, it's very. If a lot of people don't understand or they don't really care about what's beyond that. And again, when you look at stuff like smartphones and computer parts, there's no real re uh, revenance or there's no great appeal to buying a retro computer. Who here wants to buy a computer that only has, you know, 250 gigabytes of hard drive space? Or a laptop that has, what, uh, one gig of memory? Which actually, I don't even know what laptops are. Like that may that may be more on the high end side, because I don't really own laptops. Oh wait, laptops have they come with like eight gigs of RAM now? Jeez, I think some of these laptops are more powerful than my computer that I have right here now. And again, that's the crazy thing about hardware that it's constantly being moved forward like that. Again, I want my phone here with me, but. Stuff that we have today is late years. It's almost like magic compared to what we had 10 to 15 years ago. And it's hard for a lot of people to look beyond that what those games were. Stuff like the original Mario. We were talking about this last week, but if you try to play or release the original Mario today, nobody's going to buy that. Why would somebody play Super Mario Bros. 1 when they can play Super Mario Odyssey? But the point is that Super Mario Odyssey didn't just appear in Ether. It is the evolution of Mario over the last 30 plus years. 
And the only reason we could get that far is that people were still able to experience the, the older games and learn from them. And it, when you don't have that history to fall back on, you lose a lot of what makes this industry work. Again, there are so many classic PC games that we may never see full-fledged sequels to or even spiritual sequels to. Like, everybody remembers Dungeon Keeper, but they probably remember the franchise more for that horrible mobile game that EA put out. And let's see, and right now, GOG's running their Black Friday sale. And this even goes back to what we were talking about earlier, with pricing, when we talk about like uh, pricing DLC. But how do you put a price tag on retro games? I'm asking you guys, for everyone watching this live recorded, how would you price a retro game? Like, how would you put a price on something like Monkey Island? Or, um, wow, so many games. Deus Ex. The original Deus Ex. How much would you be willing to spend to play the original Deus Ex? Or, uh, even something like Pharaoh. Or I'm just getting inspiration from watching, from looking at the GOG sales list here. Um, like something like uh, Maniac Mansion. GOG prices it normally at $6. But would you really spend $6 on a game like that? And again, if you look at $6 at Maniac Mansion, and maybe like $15 for a Shoal Knight, where, how would you compare those two? Yep. There's a company, when I was at uh, the New Jersey Gamer Con this past summer, there's a company that was putting out original arcade games with the full cabinet. And they were, somebody was showing a um, FMV style quick time event. Mm hmm. Five 2D games, $10 for 3D. And um, going back to your point there, Mike, about people buying this classic might not have a Switch. Yep, and that's another interesting point. It's very weird, or it's very interesting to see, like, younger people playing these older games. Like, I would love to see, like, somebody's reaction. Like, just, like, take, like, a group of kids, like, maybe 10 to 5, I know, 8 to 10, and have them play Super Mario World for the first time, and see if they can pick it up without having any other experience. And, but again... When it comes to nostalgia, we have seen developers and companies, again, trying to mine it. Like, why should someone spend $70 for 20 Super Nintendo games, or 20 Nintendo games like that? Were those games really worth it? But then I remember spending $60 to $80 on those games back in the day for just one. But that's how things have really changed. Like, when I look at my Steam page, or my wish list for games, there are games on there that are like $5. And they can be 30, 40 hour long experiences. So why should I buy classic games that may only be a few hours long? Or I may be only get minutes of experience or minutes of joy out of them before I just want to move on to something else. And again, I'm just looking at this page on GOG for some of these games. Let's see. Uh, we have Syndicate. Uh, like the original Europa Universalis right now. They're selling it for $1.50. <laughs> yeah. Old games are hard. Mm-hmm. Yep. And like we were talking about, it is far harder to make a 3D game look good than it is a 2D game. And... I know we could easily turn this into a discussion about pixel art, but yeah, like you can do very, you can do a lot in 2D that you couldn't do in 3D. <laughs> but it's just getting harder to try and get people to experience and to understand why we play these games. Like I know right now. Oh, here's a question for everybody watching this live recorded that I want to throw out. Right now, they just released the SNK uh, Anniversary Collection. Let me see. 
it is being priced at $40 and it comes with a number of their older games and there's some uh, like little historical parts and stuff like that but when you're when you see these compilation packs so there's the Mega Man anniversary collection do you expect there to be more than just the games on there a lot of people have dinged the Castlevania pack that just came out that included Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night for just being $20 with the games and that's it and again I don't know where I stand there mm hmm early 3D has no solids yeah uh, everybody remembers of course like stuff like Super Mario or even games like Bubsy but do you expect more when you buy classic games mm hmm like how much work should go into these ports like I know a few like the the Capcom pack I think that was fairly reviewed let's see DuckTales. Here is the uh, Disney Afternoon Collection. Eh, it has mostly po very positive. And that just included six games with additional modes and, different, and additional features. <laughs> yeah, modern... Th yeah, retro 3D could be very tough, especially with how... with camera technologies as well. But again, when we talk about like these retro games, like some people will just try and do complete one to one with all this slow down and uh, screen or pixel flickering and stuff like that, while other people will try and correct that or make things better. But again, when you start doing that, that creates more money that you have to work on. And how are you supposed to convince people? that there is value there. Mm, you know, I, I don't have enough experience firsthand to say yes or no about early 3D. But again, a lot of people will look at will buy these games with their eyes first. And the graphics look bad, they're not going to look much further. And it is a lot easier to make something that looks pleasing in 2D than it is in 3D. Like, we see a lot of those very cash-grabby games like that. But, it, again, it raises that point about how much does it cost? I'm kind of curious about this. How much does it cost to get a classic game working? And then, taking that a step further, how much does it cost to then try and correct that game? You know, fix any slowdown, uh, again, flickering, stuff like that. You know, I am really tempted to buy this Disney Afternoon Collection while it's on sale. And then we have some more classic games we can play on the stream. Because I would like to go back and play DuckTales. And, of course, Darkwing Duck. Ugh. Yeah, Crash Bandicoot, that was a complete... Uh, that was a complete remake of that game, and I had some serious problems with that. But again, there's always had the different bars when we talk about these retro games. We can just talk about getting the game playable, getting it, you know, fixed up. Then we can talk about adding more features. And then we even go, like, the full modern, like, the 3D revival route, like with Spyro. Like, as another good point, the Street Fighter Collection. Here it is. So Capcom released the Street Fighter 30th Anniversary earlier this year. That includes the various arcade games, their different versions of them, and of course historical information. But how many people bought that who weren't already huge fans of it? And again, this goes back to that issue of the industry of going forward. Like, why should someone play Street Fighter 4 when they can play Street Fighter 5? And that's the thing, like, I have no 
and even I don't have nostalgia for certain franchises and genres. Like, I don't want to go back and play first generation pen and paper CRPGs. I have nothing, no interest in doing that. But I can play, you know, retro platforming and retro action games till the cows come home. I think Rob is the complete opposite there. But how do you convince someone that there is value in playing these older games who didn't grow up doing it? Because again, you put Doom next to Fortnite or next to Battlefield 5, and for a younger gamer, do they really care that Doom was one of the first FPSs? <laughs> when did Tekken 3 come out? They're up to seven already. I think they're working on another one, right? Or is that the latest one they're just doing DLC for it? And again, when it comes to the independent team, what are we up to time wise? Jeez. I've been talking I've been talking by myself for almost an hour and a half now. Uh we'll be in the wrap things up in the next few minutes. Let me see here. Oh yeah. But, like, this is why many independent developers have gone the retro scene for it. But which, it gets to that point where there's so many of those retro-driven games coming out that how are you supposed to convince someone that your retro platformer is different from this retro platformer? And I say retro platform because I just got a, uh, a new platformer to play on stream. Oh, good. That looks like it's going to be an interesting one, to say the least. And I guess my final point for tonight is that we there is such a market for these retro games and trying to convince people to play them that we do have those games being popular. <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw my old Nintendo Powers around here. You know, the future of 16-bit, and we'll never get anything better than that. And what's this strange thing called 3D games? I'm sure that will never work. Just like how nobody thought Steam was going to take over. But we are... It's, there's definitely a market for nostalgia and remakes and revivals. But how much of that is done to preserve these games, and how much is it done just to earn money? Because that's kind of the cynicism of stuff like the NES Classic and, you know, we're, I'm sure we're going to see a Xbox Classic at some point. The games they're picking, are they picking these just to, you know, get people to remember them? Or are they picking them because they want to sell them and they're the cheapest ones? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely something... It is educational and informative to having kids play these older games. Again, I would love to see some like a child play Ninja Gaiden these days. Or, I know, let's have a bunch of eight-year-olds go back and play XCOM, the original one, and see how much they will enjoy reaction fires and watch their whole team die on the very first mission. Yep. Milestone games like the ones I talked about are very much a big part of this industry. But there's still so many games that weren't milestones, or even just like very bad or weird games that have fallen, you know, into the fog or fallen to the ether that we'll never see or hear from again. <laughs> but at the end of the day, if we really want to preserve and keep this movement alive, we need to see all the games being preserved. Not just the great ones, not just the milestone ones. Yeah, there's our next one. Let's get kids to play Zork. I'm sure that... I, I just want to see their faces as you explain to them. There are no graphics. It's just text. But how do I know what I'm looking at? You read the text. And the mouth will just be like this. For the whole time. Mm-hmm. Or Atari. Let's get them to play E.T. There we go. That would be the ultimate retro experience. Get a bunch of five-year-olds and five-year-olds. You don't want to play Fortnite. You want to play Atari's E.T. The game that everybody loved back then. <laughs> but 
the cynic in me thinks that so many of these companies are trying to preserve these games just to try and sell them again. But there isn't that huge, and they're only going to make or preserve the games that are going to sell. Yep. Again, Nintendo is not stupid. They know that they can just keep re-releasing or preserving Super Mario Brothers, Legend of Zelda, and even Donkey Kong Country, and they will sell not on the nostalgia factor, but on the milestone or on the praise of those games. Nobody is going to say that Super Mario World didn't, you know, wasn't a milestone in the game's history. But game design has evolved beyond that. <laughs> and but with that said, people are going to play that game for the historical factor rather than just because it is a great game. But how many of those people would go back and play something like Kickle Cubicle, Snake Rattle and Roll? Um, hmm. Oh, I know from when I watched The Mexican Runner. How many people would want to go back and play Who Framed Roger Rabbit? The one of the many lovely games from LJN. In fact, any LJN game. How many people would spend? I know. Here's the next next hot holiday game. $30 for the complete works of LGN published titles. Now you can play Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dick Tracy, and oh, and Friday the Thirteenth for thirty for thirty dollars. How many people would buy th that? Will be the next uh, big holiday item. I guarantee it, right there. But as one final point, I keep saying that I know in television revival is going to be very interesting because I spoke um, earlier this year to one of the, to the guy who's heading that project. Yeah. And he said that a big reason for wanting to do this is that he wanted to make a system that everybody could play and to design games that are just as, you know, widely appealing as possible. And it's going to be very curious to see how that in television is going to go. Because, again, they're going to have to compete with modern games, but also with what people expect out of a purchase. Like, I can't imagine them selling in television style games for $9.99. So, there has to be a market, and there has to be money in it, or that system isn't going to sell. Because who would want to make a game and sell it for, you know, 45 cents and expect to get money? No. But I, I want, maybe I'll send him an email and see if I can get him on. Because I would love to talk to Tommy Talrico. Even beyond that, talking about, you know, video games live. Oh, yes, I watched uh, Judgment Day when he was the co-host on that. And I know, that's like a five-hour conversation, at minimum. Just talking to him about video games. But yeah, maybe I'll send uh, my contact there an email and see about getting them back on. Or see if I can get Tommy on for a, for a cast there. Because I'm sure he would love to talk about that. But, yeah, it's going to be very curious, and mm, yeah, another uh, NBA game. But, this is my final, final, final point. I, like I always say, I'm really curious to see what we're going to see in 10 years from now. Not only in terms of what's considered nostalgia, but what's in terms of preserving these games. Because it's already getting hard to preserve a lot of these older games. Not only the good games, but of course, or not only bad games, but of course, great games as well. Excuse me. I would love to play stuff like The Seventh Saga. And even, again, Donkey Kong Country 1 through 3. But what's going to happen in a decade from now in terms of these games? Will we be talking about uh, Super Mario 64 as this long-lost title that nobody can play anymore? What about a uh, Contra 3? Will the only experience people have with retro games being like the NES, these classic platforms? Not, you know, I'm not talking about like Switch or Wii U, but like the NES Classic, SNES Classic, etc. Because that is a very, very small p window into what these older games were like. I don't know what his part is, Mike, but hopefully when he's on next week, we'll be able to ask him. But yeah, I'm kind of of the 
cynicism side of this, thinking that I don't think unless things change that we'll be able to play these class and games anymore. And I hope that we see a third-party developer, a third-party company like GOG, try and take things over. Yeah. <laughs> eh? You never know. But I do think something needs to change or we need to start setting standards for preservation or we are going to lose out on a lot of the history. And with that depressing note, I think we're going to wrap it up here because somehow we have talked longer without Rob than we have with him on. So I'm going to wrap things up here. So thank you to everybody coming out for this pre-Cyber Monday talk. If you like to watch this, as if you like to watch this show ad free and uncut, be sure to check out our Patreon link down below, as well as our Discord channel, which is open to everybody. If you like to hang out and talk game design, I got something planned for tonight. I just don't know what we're going to play tonight for our classic game stream. We'll see if we can get it to work. But check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we send the art and science of games. And hopefully for our next show, Sunday at 3 o'clock or 3 to 3.30, I won't be completely broke and have my computer parts, but we'll see. So until next time, have a great weekend, and I'll catch you all next time.